Hello, and welcome to another episode of Untold Archives and Cryptid Confessions. Here's your host, Neuf Pliskin. Hey now, how the hell are you? I sincerely hope that tonight's broadcast is finding you all in good health and spirit. Welcome to a very special episode of Untold Archives. This is the soon-to-be-infamous episode 13, appropriately entitled The Deer Hunter, an in-depth encounter that spanned over nearly a decade, featuring a rogue nomadic Sasquatch and a man who was determined to try and stop the death and damage it was leaving in its wake. I want to warn you, you're about to take a trip down the Sasquatch hole. Once you begin, there's no turning back. You will hear some things that some of you will not be able to swallow. Some things are going to be a little tough to digest. I ask that you have an open mind. I have no reason to try and fool any of you. All I'm saying here is don't voluntarily be a fool. The choice is yours. So without further ado, I proudly bring you The Deer Hunter. Wife and I moved into a house in an area that was designed to be um, the future of, um, you know, forest living. They had a, uh, it was designed, I guess, back in the 60s by some hippies that thought it would be great to have an area that would be a kind of a reserve. And, you know, everybody would have their acre or two, and they had properties as big as 200 acres within this area. Um, But the one thing that they designed into it was, so none of the houses were close. They were all, I would say, five city houses, six city houses away from one another. But to the back of every house, they built in green belts um, because they wanted to have nature. There was no cutting of trees, no hunting, no anything in this area. And so, like, the green belt behind my house actually went for about 5,000 yards to a road. And uh, we moved in the house, and everything was fine. And we moved in in May, and uh, my neighbor, you know, met all the neighbors. There was only four of them on our block, and our block was about four or five city blocks long. And, you know, it was pretty nice living literally right in the forest, deer, bear, mountain lion, uh, kit, fox. We saw it all, turkeys, the whole nine yards. We had a lake. Well, they called it a lake. I'll call it an overgrown pond um, about 250 yards northeast of our house that we would walk to through paths. There were trails all through this area. So even though it was a, a very large area, there was very – um, houses were kind of splattered all through it. It eventually went defunct and bankrupt, and a group bought it, and it kind of sits the way it is today. Um, very sparsely populated, but a lot of area for growth that just never took place. So in the, the fall of 2001, um, I noticed around hunting season, you know, that August, September, October time frame, depending on which hunting season, there were always a large number of deer around, but during hunting season, it became almost a problem. Um, There were numerous times where I would see just driving to the end of my block, 20 deer. And I thought, wow, this is strange. And so I had asked my neighbor about it, and he said, you know, this has just started the last couple of years. And I asked him, I said, well, do you know what's causing it? And he said, no. And then uh, sometime around November, the mid, no, 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 first or second week in November of 2001, um, we started hearing a lot of, I, I almost can't even, it wasn't animals, it wasn't people, yeah, they were noises, the dogs. The backside of my house, I had three different streets above it. It's coming completely down a hill stop. Uh, hillside. So I had three different streets that wrapped around the hillside above me, so it was almost kind of like a backwards J with this lake at the bottom of the hill, 
and these paths going through these green belts. So all the people behind us going along the path, we would hear the dog start barking about a mile away, just going absolutely insane. And then the next house would go, then the next house, then the next house, and then it would become stone quiet. Absolutely no noise. But once the racket down there, and when it was stone quiet is when this racket was going on, these noises, grunts, yells, funny words, uh, I, you know, I heard different things, phrases coming out, and um, my neighbor, my closest neighbor, which was four properties away, his house backed up right to this path. He had two very big, very aggressive dogs, and whenever this would take place, those dogs turned into cowards. They would go hide under the deck. They wouldn't make any noise. And he was, you know, a big biker guy, Harley guy. And he came over to me. He said, Gee, you know, Ken, did you hear all that stuff last night? And I, I told him, yeah. I said, what was it? He goes, I don't know. He goes, I think maybe it was a bear or something like that. The next morning at about 4 or 4.30, the racket would start from the opposite direction. It would start out the, the back of our house and start working its way towards us, would come back around this same trail. Now, this trail was an old logging road that had eventually, the plant life had grown over it. The biggest thing that you could drive up this path was maybe one of those Kawasaki four-wheel jobs. You couldn't pick a Jeep. You could walk people maybe two or three wide on it. Um, but that's about it. There was a little seasonal stream there. There's always water down there and an, a large number of deer. So all for the month of November that year, this happened, but it continued to get worse. And, and it stopped around the 1st of December, and I thought, oh, okay. Didn't think anything about it. 2002, springtime. Late March, it was, um, in fact, I know exactly when it was, week before my cousin's birthday, so it was the last week of March. The whole thing started back up again. The deer started moving down around the homes. The racket would start at night. It would stop. It would last. This whole thing that was going on would take about 20 or 25 minutes for this thing to work its way through the area. I had no idea what it was at this point. And uh, again, in fall of 2002, it was even worse. Each, each progressive time, there was more noise, more racket. Um, I hadn't found anything odd at that point. We just, my neighbor was freaking out because he was hearing these noises literally right out his back door. Was and this a particular that, time of day? Uh, it always started at night. And it happened again the following morning. Okay. And I had figured it out. It took me a long time to figure it out. Maybe I'm slow on the head. I apologize. But um, 2004, uh, I ended up, the spring of 2004, I ended up having to have several operations on my ankle. I blew it out, lifting weights, and had to go to the doctor. This is kind of relevant to what, how I found out what, exactly what this was. He gave me a bolus of steroids to remove the swelling in my ankle after about a week after the surgery. I was supposed to be walking on it, and I couldn't walk on it, so I was a irritable, grumpy bastard, and my wife made me stay in a, the guest room that faced the trail that was about, I'd say, 105 yards away out our window down a hill. I was laying in bed, and it was about 11... 11.15, I was agitated, and I was watching TV, I don't know what I was doing. No, I wasn't watching TV, I had to, there was no TV in the room. I was just laying in bed, and, it, and I all of a sudden started hearing this noise. And it was so damn strange. I was looking around, my wife's dog, which was in the room with me, got up and, and fled. The windows, 
of my room started vibrating, and I, when I was seeing vibrating, they were dual pane windows. I know I paid a bundle for them, and they were, I thought they were going to fall out of the uh, wall. And I kind of hobbled off the bed, and I could see outside my porch light, the front porch light was on, and I could see this, I don't know what they, Wes and I went over this today. It was an adolescent deer. It was one that was probably just released by its mom by a month or two, maybe three, you know, fall the, the, the year before, so maybe four or five months. It wasn't very old, and it was out on the, just to the edge of where it starts to drop off to this trail, that there's a bunch of very young, about 100 fir trees that are all packed in this area, and it was just to the left of the fir trees, and I could just see it. And this thing was acting strange. It looked like it was spazzing out. Its head was kind of twitching and bobbing. It was standing in one place. Its right front foot would lift off the ground, kind of shaking, and when it would go down to the ground, the left rear foot, so this, all of this was kind of taking place, and I'm looking out the window, and I've got my face to it. This window's vibrating. I can hear this low growl, rumble-type thing. I don't know what you would call it. Kumbo, in your second show that I had listened to just last week, nailed it. It went on, and I could see a very faint outline of shoulders and a head. The one thing I know about the forest, I spent a lot of time in it, camping, the whole nine yards, hunting. Um, the one thing I know about the forest is you don't see straight, even, nice, curved lines like that. And this deer was doing the Funkadelic. This thing was standing about, I would say, 40 feet maybe behind it. And I could only see from about the chest up. It was extremely big, had no neck. I could just see the outline. Well, somewhere on a road up above us, and this whole time everything's vibrating in my room, I was getting kind of panicking because I didn't have any guns in there. I'm laid up. I'm seeing this weird stuff going on. Sorry, I was almost going to sling something out there. And then somebody had slammed like a car door or a tailgate or something on a road way up above us, and it stopped instantly. And the deer kind of looked around and darted off towards the road parallel to my driveway. And I watched this top half of this thing turn slowly and just kind of go down the hillside. And I was like freaking out. And I had never heard a growl, rumble thing like that before the window shaking, the dog running out of the room, being immobile. And I'm not a cowardly guy in any way. I've spent my time in the service. I've been downrange, as they say, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I was, I did, well, I'm tongue-tied now. So that's exactly how I felt then, and I'm feeling that. It's weird. I'm feeling the same way now. So the next morning, I iced my foot. I forced a boot on, got dressed. I grabbed my 357, and I headed down. I didn't hear anything the following morning. I headed down. It took me a long time to work my way down, had a cane with me, and I started going around to where the seasonal creek was. And um, I noticed two partial tracks, one on one side, which was the right heel, and the seasonal creek at that time was about 12 feet across. And I could see the toes and the front half of the foot on the other side where it touched down. So it had, in a single stride, made it across, only getting parts of its foot wet. Um, the heel was very big, very wide. I remember it was kind of stupid. I apologize. But I stuck my shoe in it, and there was a good two inches on each side of it. On the other side, when I hobble across the creek and look at the other one, I noticed there was a severe injury 
to the toes and to the ball of the foot. That's about all I could see. It was very deep where the ball of the foot on, on me would be. It was about three or four inches deep, but the rest of the partial track wasn't. The three toes, three smallest toes, were kind of twisted and moving to the left. The big toe and the one next to it were um, looked somewhat normal, but enlarged. I, I, I had nothing to compare it to, but they it just didn't look right. And this would be a common thing that I would come across. So I started like, well, this is this is huge, and I went down the trail a ways, and it was very intelligent. It would walk where there were leaves, or brush or pine needles or things where it wouldn't leave tracks. But the other thing, if you didn't really pay attention, you would see one big footprint and wouldn't think anything about it because his other one was five and a half feet away. He had a stride. Ultimately, um, a few weeks later, I got a measurement and uh, kind of a half-ass measurement, and it was a little over 19 inches uh, of the good foot. Um, I started trying to figure out what I could do, um, because the racket, the noise, the thing that was taking place during these times of year, and ultimately what it was doing is it was crossing through where we lived to go into a valley that was behind us um, that was a very specific forest that there was no hunting, no logging, no um, basically no use. It was kind of a thing that our state had decided that, you know, we're going to try this, you know, hippie biosphere thing. And it was going up and over to our area to get to this place. And it would do it a few times at springtime. Then it would go over the hill, and then it would stay. And then in fall, when the weather started to turn bad, after the salmon started running, after the rivers were all full, um, it would start this slow kind of, I guess, migration back to the area that it was going to, which is another own kind of known area for Bigfoot activity. And both areas were that it was staying at were very unpopulated, virtually no homes in either area. It was just transiting through ours to get to the deer. So 2005 came along, and everything just got worse. 2005, springtime, we had a huge number of deer around our property. I, I mean, and when I say around our property, they were right off our deck sleeping. Six in a pack, other side of uh, the redwood trees, six in a pack. There were some out a little ways. You look at the, uh, I drive home, I see four or five around my neighbor's house, six or eight around another's. They were, they were all over. I knew it was starting. And um, I thought to myself, well, I want to see this thing. I get the bright idea that I want to see this thing. I had a, a, a good night vision um, set up. It, it's an older one. It's a, they call it a generation one and a half. But it's got very good vision. It's got good distance. It's got about a two and a half power um, magnification. And I found a spot on the top of the hill where there's J kind of bends right where the seasonal creek is. I decided I needed to be kind of smart. So I grabbed a couple weapons, got some extra clothes bundled up, you know, put some fire smoke out of our wood stove on me, rubbed pine leaves and pine brush all over me to try to cover my smell. And I went and huddled out there for about three hours one night. I had my night vision. If anything, I told Wes this earlier. I noticed the dog thing starting. I'd been out there about an hour and a half, so it was probably 10, 10, 15. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the dog thing starting. And, and the funny thing about it is when the dogs didn't know what it was, they were going nuts. But when it got close enough to figure out what it was, they would shut up. And all of them would shut up but one. And it was a great, big, huge pit bull that a lady had to protect her pot. This thing was huge. 
Well, this thing would go on. Sometimes I could hear her yelling from two, three blocks above me to let, you know, for it to come in because it was going nuts. I had my night vision out, and I had it on, and I had the infrared off on it, and I was watching, and lo and behold, here it come, walking in that weird, almost, the legs almost look like a cross-country skier. Yeah, they walk with their knees bent. It, it is the strangest thing, and it, it was dark towards the bottom. It was lighter on top. It no neck, big wide. I'm a I'm a big guy. I'm an ex power lifter. You know, I used to you know, 500 pound bench presses, 1,000 pound leg lifts, things like that. I'm a six foot four, 285 pounds, and I'm a menacing guy. I'm not a very pleasant guy when I get angry, and I'm sitting here looking at something that made me feel like an absolute pussy. This thing came walking towards me. I apologize for that, Shannon. Um, this thing came walking. It was about maybe 60, 70 yards away. It was just coming into view, and it already looked bigger than me. It, it You know, through the, the night vision. So I was trying to wrap my head around what I was looking at over the fact that it had no neck. It literally, its head was sitting on muscles. The one difference between everything that I've heard on your show and what I was looking at, it was wide, it was ripped, it was, you know, that V-shape, the strange walk, but he was thin. He wasn't big and bulky. He looked old, to be honest. And it, and it could be, and, and sometimes, you know, some of the very young and the very old, um, like in the springtime, haven't fed well through the winter. I've had reports of very, very thin ones, but it's but it's not often. This was springtime, and um, yeah, that's what I would expect. Yeah, and it was it was thin, it was bad tempered. Um, I watched it maybe five times that year either in the morning on its way back. At this point, the job that I had allowed me to have a lot of time off and uh, paid time off, which was kind of nice. I got about four months a year. And thankfully, both windows fell through most of it, uh, some of the time off. And um, I had watched it walk by, had no clue I was there. I was very silent and everything. And it can just walk on. Now, the area that from where it came into vision and where it went out of my vision, I had a good amount of time to look at it. Um, it was favoring the left foot still. I had noticed that it didn't seem really occupied with anything that was going on around it. It just was walking through, just like it was had a purpose, had somewhere to go. About three or four mornings later, uh, my wife was gone for work. My daughter hadn't been born at this time, so I went out there early in the morning, and I camped out, and I wanted to see if it was going to come back the same way. Now, it always didn't take the same path. There were sometimes it would go back another way. Uh, sometimes it wouldn't come in our way, but would go back our way. But I started over time getting an idea of where it was traveling, judging by the dogs barking. Seems dumb. Those two times of year when these dogs, I mean, they went nuts when deer were around, but at night and in the morning, in those two time frames, it was insane. And um, about three or four mornings later, I'm out there. I'm behind a bush. I can't, I think I'm just the cat's meow watching this thing come by me again. And, and I remember thinking, you know, maybe I'm too close. And, you know, maybe I shouldn't have a rifle. I got all this stuff going through my head. I had a pistol with me at the time. And it walked by and it turned and it was now walking away from me and was going up this trail. And I was losing it. And I hit that infrared button on mm -hmm. my night vision. It saw it, didn't it? It turned around in the blink of an eye. Huh. And it knew the area that I was in. And I could tell it was not happy. 
It already had a messed up, kind of messed up looking face. I couldn't ever see its face. I, you know, I don't think I ever saw its ears. It had very long hair, kind of grayish down the back, uh, light brown, brown in the front. But the gray hair on the back was very long, um, four or five inches. I, what I don't ever understand about people is they always say it looks like wool or fur. To me, it looked like hair. It didn't look like fur of any kind. That's what I would have said with my own encounters. It looked like hair. It didn't look like fur. Yeah. I always hear people, oh, it looks woolish and all that. And I'm like, are you looking at the same thing that I've, I've seen? It's hair. I mean, it looked <laughs> like hair. But I never could see the ears. I and that's very that. typical. That's very really? typical. Oh, yeah. Mo the vast majority of sightings, nobody ever sees the ears. Now, I thought with the head being a big block, it was very blocky. Extremely pronounced jawline. Um, yeah, very heavy. I was going to say the ears, are, you know, we used to think, and they probably are, you know, probably smaller and, and set very close to the head, and they're covered with hair. Uh, I was starting to get little bits and snippets of it a little closer, and um, it stopped. He went over the hill, went over the top of the ridge, didn't see anything. A bunch of start, you know, a lot of people were talking about strange activity all year. When I would go into the gun store, people were talking about, you know, animals being torn up, you know, a pony got uh, its neck broke, and, um, but this was now all south of me. I thought, well, maybe it's him, maybe it's not. I, I didn't know who to talk to. I had started looking online. I started reading, and everything I read was all over the place. And this, by this point, it didn't seem to be bad. It just seemed to be passing through, except for the strange behavior, the noises, and the, the you know, occasionally throwing a tree or something, right? And the fall of 2005, it all changed. I don't know what it was with its demeanor. And by this time, I had been looking on all the other trails, the logging roads for tracks of another one, never found any anywhere except for the other path that he was using, and uh, or a couple of other paths that he was using when he wasn't using the one close to my house. It was about 10 or so at night. We were, my wife and I were, I don't know what we were doing, had the TV on in the family room, and we started hearing this of a young deer just crying out. And I remember walking kind of out of the kitchen into the, and we could hear this over our television. I mean, it was wailing, absolutely wailing. And I went out and I turned the TV off or down. I opened up my front door and I remember looking over at the clock and I could hear this thing just wailing and wailing and wailing. It went on for over six minutes. And I thought, oh, my God. And, you know, we had these deer all around the house. The deer were all shifting away. They were all running, you know, away from the noise. And I thought, well, I'm not going down there now. And um, so I waited till well after sunup, um, about 8 or 9 o'clock, grabbed a rifle, pistol, headed down there. Um, took me a little bit to find it. I kind of knew the area very closely to where it was at, but it was right off the trail. And the game used the trail too. And um, its hind leg was ripped out of its socket so violently that it had tears in its fur on the inside underneath. I started looking more closely at it, and there was a big opening in blood right at the base of the neck. There was a great big huge footprint right on its leg, its left front leg. It was laying on its right side. You could see a muddy footprint where this thing stood on its leg, grabbed its snout and the base of its skull, and pulled its head off. Mm. And the head was about, it was, I had, I had told Wes earlier, it was very similar to the pics from Oklahoma except it was the hind leg, not the front. The leg wasn't broken. It was literally ripped out of the socket, like it had turned it all the way up 
over its back. And um, there was an opening. There was some insides missing. The head was, I don't know, 10, 12 feet away. Uh, there were a lot of birds, crows, ravens, all that stuff about nothing will ever touch the kill. There were flies on it and everything else, but it, it didn't take any the, the whole deer. And that kind of puzzled me. And then I started worrying about, God damn it, I'm standing here. You know, if this thing's around, I didn't hear anything. It was kind of quiet. Yeah, so you wouldn't I be had, in a good place. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, you know, and I just remember looking at it at first, and then I got this kind of panicky feeling, and I, I pushed, I knew which deer it was, too. It was the one that frequented our, our house. It had a little notch in the top of its ear. And I pushed it up underneath some brush. I didn't, because kids come through there sometimes in the afternoon or families. I didn't want anybody finding it, and it was visible from the trail. Um, and I left. And then at night, I heard a little bit of ruckus and heard some weird sounds. And I had told Wes that it sounded like it was saying north or out. And it, it would, then it made little short bursts of like anger noises. And then it was quiet. I went back down the next morning, deer was gone, head was still there, uh, but the deer was gone. And um, from that point on, it turned into crazy town. I called the BFRO after that, and I went through a whole bunch of, uh, uh, called the BFRO, had a bunch of back and forth. They wanted to come out and talk to me. I wasn't too keen about it, um, both for the reasons I would stated to you guys. And um, so one person passed me off to someone else who passed me off to someone else. And then finally, someone called me from up in Eureka, and they gave me a name of a guy to call and told me to call him on a certain day. And I had stopped going down there or even trying to watch because the noises were becoming more insane. It was, you know, we were finding more debris, trees being pulled out and thrown, none of the twisting, none of the X's, nothing like that. It just seemed like anger stuff. And... So that I called a guy on the day, and he asked me if I wanted to do an incident that he'd be willing to drive down. He told me his name was Jim. And then he proceeded to tell me about what an expert he was. <laughs> um, I've been on six expeditions. I've been on television. And it started out squatch this, squatch that, squatch, 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 squatch. And at some point, I had to tell him to shut the F up. <laughs> I, 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 I don't mean to laugh, but those people those people crack me up. <laughs> well, honestly, I think it's that idiot that's on the TV show. His name was Jim. What's that idiot Dumbo? Oh, Bobo. Is that big guy? Is it is it Bobo? Oh yeah, James. His James is his full name, right? James Fay. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I honestly I think it was him. Because he was talking about all these expeditions, the fact that he'd been on TV, and mm. and I started telling him about the stuff that was happening and how it was kind of ramping up. I mean, I could tell it was ramping up, and um, and he, well, that's not normal squatch behavior, you know, no. the gun. And, and, you know, and I started telling him, I said, look, I said, there's a lot of people around here. There's kids. There's dogs. By this time, dogs were missing by droves. There were literally sign after sign after sign. We lost cats. Um, there would, you would go to a telephone pole, and there would be 30 missing pet things out there. They were going after the easy meals. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And... By this time, its foot was healing up pretty good. Some of its tracks, it, it didn't have that deep impression. Its toes were still kind of messed up. Um, but after that point, I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I can't do anything with you. He goes, well, I was just down in your area, you know, a few months ago, and, and you know, some people were hearing calls and stuff like that. And I told him, I said, that's good. You should go down and talk to them again. Uh, I, I, I can't do it. So um, it stopped sometime after that and I kind of had given up on it a little bit 
and I noticed um, the following season it became more violent. And so I got the bright idea to call the sheriff's department. And um, at this point, I was getting concerned about going out there at any time. And um, because I didn't know if this thing, you know, we would hear him mostly after dark. And he was very intelligent. He knew the traffic patterns where we lived. And his movement through there started right after the second bit of traffic at night. 9, 9.15 would start over by the other side, and then it would slowly come and work its way around us and up over the hill. The next year, more more of the, the, the cruel deer killings, I had started calling it Satan, Satan and Lucifer. It wasn't I'm a hunter. My father put food on his table. He had to when he was young. And my dad preached to me, even when I was in the military, you go for a quick, clean kill. You don't torture, you don't toy, it's not a game. This thing was toying with these things, and we heard it more often than I could care. It just still bothers me. I actually uh, remember standing there looking at one one time, and I was crying. I was thinking to myself, why do this, and, you know, tearing it up? At that time, the big pit bull, the lady got it. You gotta remember, this is a huge marijuana area. Everybody's got pit bulls, Dobermans, big aggressive dogs. There are people out with guns, not necessarily in around the homes. Some do. Um, the lady with the big pit bull came down to my house and told me that her um, dog was gone. And I had seen her before and talked to her before. She was putting up signs. She asked me to, um, if I'd see it, if I would call her. I told her, you know, there's a very good possibility that your dog's dead. And she goes, I know, but if you know, let me know. So I went in the house and grabbed a rifle, grabbed a pistol, flashlight. It was in the afternoon. I went down, started looking around towards where I saw most of the normal deer kills. Nothing. Went back over towards the seasonal creek, which was running. Again, both times a year it, it was running when this thing would come through. Um, up under kind of a little area off, about 200 yards from the back of her house, straight down the hill, was her dog. And it was in pieces. And as far as I can tell, nothing was ate. There was literally a leg over there, a leg over there, a leg over there. It looked like it had been pulled apart, and I remember thinking, I never heard it. You know, we heard the ruckus at night. I heard, you know, her dog barking, but I never heard this thing get destroyed. Started calling the sheriff's office. I started telling them that there's some crazy man that's behind our homes, and other people were talking about it, too. It, you know, it wasn't like it was just me. But people were talking about some of the stuff we'd be walking. We stopped walking the trails. We would start walking down our streets. And I ran into people, and they were like, you know, and they would have guns with them when they never did before. So people understood that something was going on. I went and told her lady, the lady about the dog that, you know, you might want to give it up. I had, I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to go down into it because it was a very kind of a crevice area with a lot of brush. And by this point, I had no faith or trust that I was going to walk out of there alive. Honestly, didn't think that I would be fine. Um, later that year, when it started back up, I started calling the sheriff's department regularly. By this point, we're up in late 2006, early 2007. The sheriffs came out. Uh, they could hear the ruckus. It kind of slowed down because the sheriffs had all their lights pointing down this hill in front of my house towards that area, and it kind of quieted down. And I told them, well, aren't you guys going to walk down there? And they both looked at me, and they said, no, no. And I called them again, again. And what I was trying to do was get help, you know, trying to get somebody to realize that this thing was down there without saying that it was a monster. Right. I get a phone call from someone at the sheriff's department saying that, you know, 
we don't think that this is necessarily a good idea that you keep calling like this because and I said, you know, I told him once, why don't your officers ever go and check it out? Well, you know, we have better things to do, blah, blah, blah. So they gave me the name to the fish and game for our state, and I called the fish and game. And I told them that we had a problem, They that the sheriff's department thought it might be a bear. So a guy comes out about a week later, and then we're now into the, the fall time. He brings a bear trap, you know, one of the big tube things. Mm -hmm. and he's got a big steel tray in there full of dog food, bacon grease, and I don't remember what the other thing that he said that he used. First night, I never heard anything. I went out and looked at it the next morning. The whole tray of dog food was gone. Not spilled, not tipped over, gone. And it was the bottom half of a 55-gallon drum cut with two handles on it. And so I called the guy, and I told him I said, I think you're have lost your bait and he goes well they do knock it over I said no it's gone and he kind of got quiet and he goes well I'll come out and see you in a few days I'm over in this other area right now and I don't have time to come pick it up he came over and he picked it up and he said you know this could be another problem but he wouldn't really say and so I started talking with him about it, and, and he said, you know, they have these problems over in this area and that area, and um, he goes, there's really not a lot you can do about it except for, you know, I, the, the same things that I was trying. I finally decided to get the bright eye idea to get rid of it, and I went out. It was late. I was kind of hanging out over a my my regular hidey hole. I saw it walk down the trail and go to the right of a big area of brush. And I watched that area and I watched that area for about 20 minutes and I thought, it's gone. I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching. Don't see anything come out the other side. Didn't hit my IR. I could see the pathway where we would walk. I thought, okay, well, it must be gone. So I walked down the hill very quietly, started walking down towards where this opening was. And, and there, there was about a two or three foot opening above your head where the brush didn't touch. And I had a good, very, very good view of this trail. I got closer and closer and closer, and I saw where it walked up to the right behind the shrubs. God, this almost sick to my stomach. And I could see that well, it's not there, and I'm kind of looking, and I've got my rifle in my hand, one hand, I have my night vision in the other, and I kind of look off to the left, and there he is. I dropped my night vision, I dropped to my knee, I raised my rifle up, I had the safety off, it was in a effing fraction of a second. I could see just the top of his head, about the, most of the right side, I half the nose, the shoulder, you know, the mouth. It was less than five or six feet away from me, just on the other side of the shrubs that were on the opposite side of the trail. I have absolutely no idea how it got from one side of the trail to the other. It either climbed a tree or it jumped or it ran a hell of a long ways down where I couldn't see it and turn around and came back. And I've got my gun, and I had a Mini 30 with me. I had this barrel pointed at this thing, and it was kind of leaning towards me, and its head was kind of coming over the brush, and I could hear its hand working its way through the brush. I'm taking slack out of the trigger. I'm looking at it, and just as fast, as it started, it turned and walked away. And I think the motion that it did with the leaning over and putting the hand through was letting me know this was going to be a mutually assured destruction scenario. I had a headshot. Could have very easily taken it. I could have dumped 10 of them in his head before it left. I went back. I went home. I was scared. 
I'm not going to go into the whimpering or changing the shorts moment, but it was pretty darn close. The only thing I think that ever scared me more than that was indirect fire. I went back around noon the next day <laughs> and couldn't find a way how he got from one side of the trail to the other. Did, are you sure it was the same individual? Oh, it was the same one. The gray hair, the gray, I, I was I was so damn close to it. I, there was enough moonlight. Um, it was the same one. In fact, he had the, the same effed up left foot. Now, whether he walked on pine needles and walked a long way, you know, there's other options. I'm just not saying that he uh, beamed himself up like Scotty and moved. Right. Through. There's all kinds of things that happen out there. Yeah. There, you know, he did something clearly that it was smarter than I. So he had known that I was there, obviously, off and on for a while, and he let me know that he didn't like it. He didn't make a noise other than leaning kind of over so his head could get closer and his head was messed up. I told Wes earlier that um, I think we Down syndrome was kind of the thing that we came up with. Didn't have the pointy cone head, though, but I can tell you close how tall he was. I'm six foot four. When I reach up and touch my nine foot ceiling, my fingers are bent about, eh, I got another three inches to go. He was every bit of that, if not more. Head was very blo kind of blocky, almost looking very, very pronounced jaw. The eye was kind of, I don't know, it was black. Nose looked like a seven year old Michael Jackson that had been punched 20 times. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, it had the long gray hair, had some hair kind of hanging towards its eyes, and it had hair up on its cheeks, but you could see its eyes, and its eyes were kind of far apart. When he kind of turned and bent over, they seemed unnaturally kind of far apart. They didn't seem close. Yeah, it's different than human proportions. Yeah, it was very odd. His head, easily, bigger than mine, with a helmet on. I yeah, they're mean, massive. I did, didn't see the air. No air. I, it was covered with either with hair. But, I mean, there wasn't even like a print, you know, a, uh, something sticking out like where the air would be. It was weird. Yeah, they lay pretty close to the head. <sighs> so, it, it left. 2008 came. We had huge fires in our area. A lot of things, strange things started happening, but I also noticed more people were complaining in other areas. So I was getting the impression that this thing wasn't leaving our area as much and was just going for whatever it could get. We had an idiot DFRO person that was associated with him. I don't know what she did that was close by us that started with leaving apples, big bags of apples, old apples out there. Um, the dog thing continued. Um, <clears throat> by this point, it was it was now coming closer to the homes. It wasn't sticking to the trails. Um, late 2008, after most of the fires, we had a lot of fires around. There were several sightings all over the county during that time. The lady that had moved in, which would be across the street from us, she was still quite a long ways away. She was... Uh, six months pregnant, just starting to show really good, had that nice little bump out. She came screaming out of her house one night that there was a man in a tree looking at her in her house. She had a kind of English Tudor style two-story two job, big deck, steep hillside, and she was, I heard her and instantly grabbed the, my rifle, went out, and I went down to the street, and I, I told her, don't go back to your house, dial 911, see what it is. So I walked down to her house, and I looked, and I could see him coming out of the tree. She thought it was a man wearing a fur coat or a fur jacket of some kind. And he went down the tree. The tree was probably a 180-year-old redwood, so it was probably 200 or so, close to 200 feet tall, maybe a little older than that. It went down that tree like a squirrel, like a squirrel. He was so far up in the top of the tree that the tree was slain. And he's shooting down this thing, 
and was gone. So at this point, I know he knew who I was, and he damn well knew I knew who he was. Sheriff showed up. They went down there again. They saw me, weren't happy, wouldn't go down. Ended up calling the sheriff a few more times. My neighbor lost both his dogs. People down the street lost their dogs. Called the sheriff's one time when it was going berserk. The neighbor that lived next to me that had lost the dogs had moved out. This was 2008. We're getting up around 2008, 2009 now. Huge crush, stock market crash. A lot of people were overinflated on their homes. And literally half of this neighborhood I lived in was empty. And um, that just made things worse. But it made it easier for me to go poking around. And I went around the back of my neighbor's house, and I would sit back there and, and watch it. But the good thing was is I was a lot better hidden. At this point, it was, it was having bag lady moments. And I'm not kidding. It would walk. It would stop. It would fling its arms around and <laughs> make these noises and walk off. And a lady the following winter, it, now the deer thing was a steady thing. The deer were being found fairly regularly, um, still kind of migrating. But the following winter, um, this time my, my daughter had been born, and I was spending more time with my wife and kids. I was waiting to take my daughter to see um, a specialist. And we were parked down at the end of the road. It was really icy, and we, and we were waiting for the ice truck to come by. There was light snow on the ground. It was about 6, still dark. And she was sitting in her, her child seat in the back, and I hear, see him standing out in the middle of this road, waving his arms at a car coming down the hill. The lady actually crashed her car. It went off the, on the side towards the edge of the lake, and she was sitting there looking out the window with this thing waving its arms, and then it just turned around and walked off. And it was all icy and everything, and I, I thought, well, I think I'm going to head home and call the doctor and tell him we're not coming because we had a long drive ahead of us. And I went home and took, the, took my daughter home, and this stuff was started happening in so many places. I started noticing, I went to a little market that was in our area, and I kid you not, there were 250 missing pet signs up there. So not Good only was he doing this where we lived, but he was going other places when we didn't see him. I don't know if it was in the daylight, if it was whatever, but he would at times, when he went over the top of the ridge late at night, I, by this time I'm now driving around at night trying to figure out where he's going. And I figured out for the most part where he was coming from and where he was going to. He'd go over the top of the ridge, and he'd go over this valley behind us that was empty. The only thing that runs out there is a set of railroad tracks that are only used for seasonal train ride stuff. He would go out. He would go about two-thirds of the way down the hill, and he would let out a scream that I promise you was heard 20 miles away. Just a gut. And the funny thing about it, it was deep, but yet it had high notes in it just a ripping, and it would go on for about a minute and a half, and then it would walk on down into that valley. So we have started having a lot of other problems in this area at the time. We had a lot of people move in that were more pot growers and grifters, and uh, the seasonal pot people were coming in. Some people, a couple of people actually came up missing. Um, the sheriffs finally told me, the last thing that they told me was, don't call us unless somebody's being killed. Don't ever call us again. And wow. When That's kind of their job to respond. Yeah. No, I, I did you not. They told me, don't call unless somebody's dying. And I told them, so can I take the law into my hands at this point? And I told them I wanted that in writing, which they never did. But I called twice more. They never responded. But the guy the night before that I had called on that, there were two of them showed up. And one of them had been there four or five times before. And this ruckus was going on down there, and you could hear it. You went just, nope, 
and you can hear shit breaking. You could hear stuffing in front. I told him, I said, are you going to go down there? I said, if you'd like, I could go up to my house and grab a gun and I'll go down with you. They go, no, we don't need to. We have a pretty good idea where it's going to come out at. Oh, interesting. Hmm. And I said, it? He goes, yeah. He goes, uh, and he's, they're, got their, their spotlights then going down the hill just like they did before. Um, you know, they were, I could tell they didn't want to go down there. They knew exactly <laughs> what they Yeah, I, 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 and to be perfectly honest, I didn't want to go down there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know, three of us, <laughs> I thought with three of us, I might have a little bit bigger balls, but um, I, I didn't. They laughed, and I heard them drive up to the street above us, which had better visibility down into the valley, uh, down to this area. But they left, and then I got the call the following day that, that I was never to call them again unless somebody was dying. So many things happening in the area, both with this and with, you know, these, these strange people coming into the area. Like I said, a couple of them disappeared. They had a lot of disappearances during the last few years that we lived there. And the reason why the police never really made a big deal out of it is a lot of the seasonal help for the, the pot comes from other places. There are people from other places coming up looking to just be part of the pot business. And um, so uh, there were flyers, you know, guys from San Jose, Texas, Seattle that, had, you know, hadn't returned home. But nobody, you know, it never made the news. It was never talked about. There was just these missing persons flyers. So I found a guy that would give me information or would talk to me about it. And um, this kind of happened a few years before. It was in um, 2005. And I didn't. I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this. I talked with Wes about it a little bit, but I, I kind of just decided to because this guy helped me out a lot, even though he's dead now. But he helped me out quite a bit. He was a he was a pot farmer. He had several hundred acres in a, in an area that was very remote, very steep, heavily wooded, very difficult to get to. He had a cabin that he had built that was very very well built, and he had been doing this for a number of years. He was a wealthy man. I don't know why he continued to do it. He owned a million-dollar home over on the coast, or actually a multi-million-dollar home. But it's just what he did. He got burnt by the government, and he wanted to kind of burn him back, I guess. I had found him through a friend. And in 2005, I went and met and talked with him. Obviously, he's very paranoid. He literally spent six or seven months a year watching his crops, hundreds of acres of pot. Uh, and it was intermingled, you know, down the hillsides, water system, um, forest, can't be seen, you know, very secretive. These guys are very, very good at this stuff. I talked with him quite a bit about it, and he told me, he said, you know, I've had my problems out here. And he goes, I have problems out here to this day. And he had told me that several years before that, in the late 90s, 98, 99 time frame, um, he started getting harassed. He said, and it started out a lot like a lot of your um, listeners, banging on a cabin, a rock here and there, and he had rapidly escalated. Yeah, the situations he, ramp up. Yes, and he told me this, and this is where I got the only little knowledge I have about the situation now. He told me, he said, that if you ignore them, they may not ignore you or they may. I looked at his, he showed me his cabin, and it was about 20 by, not even that, maybe 16 by 18 or 20 with a little loft. He built the loft after his first major incident, which I'm going to talk to you right now. He, um, in the late 90s, started having a problem with one that was about seven to eight feet tall, and he doesn't know how it started. The thing seemed to be fixated on his cabin. And it would come around. Now, the cabin only had two windows. 
and they were east and west. So sunlight in and sunlight in the evening. The rest of the time he was out tending to stuff. He had a generator buried underground uh, in a 20-foot container unit with all his supplies and stuff, and he was very, very heavily armed. Um, those guys have to defend their crops, and they do it, and they will kill you. And um, he was dead serious about it. He was ex-military, and you know he made a lot of money. He told me he made six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year cash. I asked him what happened. He said, "Well, this it just continued to the point where small things, and uh, you know the banging, and he'd be out during the day, and a rock." the size of a grapefruit would fly by his head. He wouldn't know where it was coming from. And then, so he started getting kind of panicky, and so what he noticed is it was late in the afternoon, all night, and in the morning, and he was becoming extremely paranoid. And he had stills on the inside of his front door was made with two-by-fours, and it was literally blocked in with two-by-fours, and it was the most solid door I'd ever seen. It had an old-fashioned iron latch on the inside and had a rope that went up under the eaves to the top that you could barely see where he would pull it to open it. He had a, about a four- or six-by-six six opening in the door that he would put a two-by-four behind where he could look out at his crops because his cabin was right at the top of the hill, and he could see right down the hill. This thing got the banging on the house, and it was multiple at a time, single at a time. He, get, he was getting to the point he was now drinking because he was paranoid and scared. He was drinking a lot of alcohol. Finally, he hears a big commotion at his front door, and he takes this 2 by 4 off this little peephole that was about 4 by 6 and literally was a hole. There was no glass, no nothing. And he opens it up, and he sees the back of a head out his front door. And all he said, he sees his hair, and by this time he had seen him several times. And he took a 357 and shot it promptly in the back of the head. And it dropped right there where it was, was standing. It was a bunch of commotion outside. Um, he didn't go outside. He didn't do anything. The next morning, he found it laying out there. Um, he couldn't move it. He said he was, became kind of distraught when he rolled it over because of how human-looking the face was. When I told him the one that I saw, he said it didn't look like that. He said it looked very human. And it, it bothered him. And it bothered him to the point that, you know, he started drinking more. He eventually died a few years after that, or a few years after I talked to him in 2005. But it, um, he didn't know what to do with it. He didn't want it on his property because of the fact that it looked so damn much like a human, except for big and hairy. He had to take a chain and wrap it around its legs and drive it down the road, and he dumped it in the river. And he said it went about 100 yards down the river, and it got hung up on some rocks and a couple, you know, log snag type of stuff. And he said it was there all the, that day, that night. And he said it wasn't going to become unsnagged. He figured somebody would find it. Other Hot farmers would talk about this stuff. The next morning it was gone. And the next morning his problems became worse. So he would be stuck in this place all summer, drinking, trying to keep his paranoia in check. He eventually went and bought a 50 BMG bolt action rifle because things came so bad. And when I saw him, he had at least 20 weapons in the house, everything from H&Ks, but the, the 50 BMG I saw, and he said about six or eight minutes later, he shot a second one with that from the roof of his cabin because they would not leave him alone. Um, his crop came in. He never touched that. He doesn't know if it died. He didn't, you know, he said it kind of went down the hill and was tumbling. But anyone that knows a 50 BMG round, I doubt it got up. Yeah, 50 cal is pretty serious. Yeah, and he showed me the bullets. And he was using 600 grain bullets, and um, he 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 died a couple years after that. I actually bought some of his guns, but he he kind of told me a lot about 
what they do, and and he said if they decide to fixate on you, you're in trouble. And he told me to kind of try to let it go as much as I could. But with the problems that I was having in my neighborhood, my wife and I had finally, because we had a daughter, she was very young, everybody on our street was now pot growers. And uh, we had other bad behaviors going on. People were now shooting, most likely at this at night. We could hear it more frequently. Its behavior became more deranged. And so my wife and I just decided in 2011 to leave. We gave our house up. We walked away from it. Uh, like I told Wes earlier, I thought I was done with it. I was just going to give it up and walk away, and then was never going to look at this again. Um, my job gives me the ability to work with people all over the United States, really all over the world. Not long after I moved to the area where I'm at now, I was working with some people up in the Pacific Northwest, and one of them um, had told me about some emails that he had. This was in late 2011, and he showed me some emails from people, and, and I had to kind of work this out with Wes today, who was, who was boss and who wasn't. But it was starting with people from like the BLM and the Forest Service, and it was the Department of the Interior were involved in these messages, and and they were people that were afraid to go into certain forested areas of Oregon and Washington, and they were wanting assistance from the Department of the Interior about the problem, quote, the problem. He had showed me some messages that had to do, you know, do responses back where you can't tell anyone. If you tell anyone, you know, you could be in prison, you can lose your job, just group up, have more people go with you, you know, or, or if you have to go into that area, you know, take guns, you know, it, it was this whole thing. And, and the second or third email the guy showed me, the lady actually had stated, she said that she had been like an 18 year and she had never seen anything like that and she said Squat Sasquatch is real, it's in my forest, it's dangerous and it's destroying things. And she was talking about a campground in Oregon and she wanted help to go in on a snowmobile to try to figure out what was going on because it was in the winter time. Uh, my friend who showed me these, showed me some from other places as well. And I thought, wow, this is really kind of interesting that they're openly talking about it, that they openly know that people are in danger and are not doing anything about it. It was started to ring back true around um, my sheriff's department. And so I started getting kind of ticked off. So I started reading some books called Missing 411 you know, listen to some of the stuff online, and this is over the last few years, and I started getting the idea that there's there's got to be at least some correlation, not all. I'm not saying that all of the stuff that he's talking about is it, but when we talk about the case where the Green Berets get called in and uh, the dogs won't hunt and the dogs lay down and, and people are found supposedly killed by a bear attack, but the bear first undid their pants pulled their pants down to their ankles, took their shirt off, devoured them, and all they find are the pants with the socks and the shoes and the bones of the feet left in it. Now, I know bear. I've hunted bear. And I'm pretty sure bear can't undo a pant and pull it down no. to one ankle. So I started getting the idea that something has got to be done. And um, I started reaching out to more people and talking to more people. And I actually ran into one of the, the guys that was working with the missing 411 thing in an airport about six months ago, eight months ago, when I was flying uh, back east. And he said that they haven't even begun to touch on it and um, talk about the problems in Texas. And Florida are so bad that they don't even – they're not even part of the books. And he wouldn't really go into any details. And, and I know that, I, I think, Will, it was you that said that um, you felt that he gave Pilatus embellishes a little. And after looking over the information, I thought the same thing at first, but he has done such a thorough job in researching this against these national parks. Do you understand where all of this stuff is happening? 
that that their biologist up in Alaska or was it Canada got devoured. Right. You know, you start looking at this stuff and you start realizing what I already know. They're monsters. They're dangerous. You look at Hanobia or Hanola, Oklahoma, the Humphreys, they're dangerous, right? Absolutely. So I found your guys' show about a month and a half ago, and, and I had told Wes that I'm sitting down and I am now going, I'm going to start working on a documentary. I came across, I was working with some people a few weeks ago who um, had access to some information in Texas, specifically around a torn up camp. And I had the ability to take a look at some of this information. And if nobody remembers, um, Bob, I believe his name is in Texas, posted the video of the torn up camp. Um, right. I, had the op- I had the opportunity to take a look at some information that went back and forth between the agencies. They know what the problem is. They know what's going on. Uh, some of the quotes that I heard in there were talking about their migration routes, using the Big Sandy, going between one location to another, uh, certain roads that they're crossing in, in the SAM, uh, the SAM Houston National Forest. Um, they were talking about how uh, in a park called the Big Thicket, one of these messages that I had read, that the Big Thicket, when I looked up on a map, I when I left, and I only see one park, but apparently there's four of them that are associated with this big thicket national preserve. And part of these messages that they were talking about were these different areas. So that this is 16 missing people in the last three years, and your serial story is no longer going to cover it. And it was spelled serial killer. At one point, there were actually some references in there to case law that helped Bob, meaning that they were, they had somebody from within the state had quoted law that um, said that he couldn't be in trouble for videotaping this. And these, these messages that went back and forth, obviously the people, the local people were deeply concerned about what actually happened. But the federal government was not. The federal government was, from what I could tell, trying to crucify everybody involved. But another odd thing that came up in these emails, so not only did they know their migration patterns, where they were going, but they also stated that the Big Thicket National Preserve is a biosphere, bio-something preserve and once you enter it, you are no longer an American citizen. You are no longer really? an American citizen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's part of a deal. I, I couldn't believe it. I had a heart attack when I read that. So had he been in that park, all bets were off. Another thing that um, was kind of, well, that the wording, Texans, got to love them. I mean, they think that they're their own planet or something. But uh, this wording, talking about these laws and stuff, and, and this, they didn't care about where they think it was a biosphere or something preserved under UN control. They said in the email that he was obliged, comma, no, obligated to render assistance to those in the camp. The response that came back from a three-letter agency that I don't know um, was they didn't care what he did or where he was at. They they told the people in Conroe, Texas, to not. There was there's a um, what did we figure out, Wes? Equine search, horse search. Yeah. There's an yeah. There's, yeah. There's a there's a horse searching agency in Texas that is like I guess the best. They have horses, quads all these vehicles, hundreds of people, and when missing people come out, these guys go in and, and I guess, absolutely friggin' save the day. They were not to be contacted. There's to be no missing people. And to kind of validate the information when I was talking with Wes earlier today, I gave him the timelines, the dates, 
you know, or rough estimates because I was looking at information that had been archived and stored long after it, it was actually had been passed from person to person. So I was working on guesstimates because archived messages, when when they get stored, they don't look in their email fashion. We were actually we're looking at it in, North, in Notepad, right? And so I was having a guess, but the dates were all pretty close. I'm um, going back to when it originally happened, and I'm. I'm pretty confident that that's the same Bob that they were talking about. One of the things they said that, that they were going to keep a close eye on them and um, that they didn't care how many people they were not to say anything and leave it to the federal government to take care of. And once I had read that a few weeks ago, I I honestly, I sat down and listened to almost every show that you had online because I had been trying to find somebody, this isn't right. I don't, I don't care what this thing is, to me it's a monster. I don't care if somebody thinks it's a fucking furry little friend passing flutes out in the forest. These things are dangerous, they're killing people, the government knows they're killing people, they're all over the place. And one of the messages that I read said they are, are basically there's a hell of a lot more than what people think. They're not on right. the endangered species list. I, I started thinking about this, and I, I thought about something that I did. And this is a good good piece of information for anybody out there that ever plans on looking or getting involved with this. Go buy a cheap burner cell phone from Walmart, put 200 minutes on it, keep a couple of them around, because this is, I did this once towards in 2010 when we had an issue where I lived, where this thing was located. I had cell service, and I dialed 911 from that phone, and I left it there. And the sheriff showed up, but they wouldn't go into the area because the thing was still making a racket. But that's something people like Bob and you and everyone else can remember. You don't have to use your own phone. You you should videotape this stuff. People have not only the right under law, but a God-given right to know that there is a threat out there like this. And I'm going to plan on uh, trying to find the right group of people to start working forward to see what we can do to let people know. Because I've heard everybody's reports here, and I don't know, Shannon, have you seen one yet? I have not. Be thankful. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of one of the dumb ones that say I want to see one, but after hearing, you know, some of these stories, I, I, I do second guess my 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 wish to see one. No, I, I, I'll tell you, it's all awe-inspiring. I have nightmares about hearing those deer getting killed. And in, and that seem, might seem odd to some people. It's just a deer. Mm -hmm. Six or eight minutes of listening to that, it still horrifies me. You it, know. It's pretty gruesome. Yeah. You know, and... and the tearing the dog apart, and, you know, I don't know how many times I've actually seen him. I didn't keep count. I wasn't all into trying to make foot casts or anything like that. I was, I was in, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I couldn't, I knew I couldn't talk about it. Hell, if I would have went down to the, the sheriff's department and say, hey, I got a big foot behind my house, <laughs> they'd have ran me out of town. In fact, they almost did anyway. And I never told them what I was seeing. I don't believe that people truly understand how dangerous this is. Um, they don't. That's why they all want to run out there with a camera and try to find one and, you know, feed them and do all these silly things. They have no clue what they're up against. I, one thing, you know, I thought was fascinating about you were talking about the emails back and forth between the different departments in Washington and Oregon. And I told you this earlier, Ken, about eight months ago, I was contacted by a state biologist in Washington, one in Washington and actually one in Oregon. And both had been in service for a long time. They've been doing it for a long time. Up until recently, they had gotten an email stating not to go in a certain area unless they go in groups of three and they go in well armed. And I remember the guy I was talking to in Washington, he was blown away by it. He said, Wes, I've been doing this for 20 years. We never go in well armed, and I never go in with groups of people. Usually, it's just me. And now, all of a sudden, we have to uh, go in with groups of three and well armed. 
And the other thing he said was he started questioning it, started questioning his boss and saying, well, why? And first they said it was a bear. And he kind of laughed that off because these guys see bear all the time. But he kind of laughed that off. And then the story kind of changed and said, well, there's um, there's reports of a crazy person out there. And he still kind of questioned it. And then he started to get threatened that you do it this way or you go find another job. And they were very oh, direct with him. The one in Washington was about eight months ago. And the okay. one in Oregon was probably more like six months ago. Okay. Um, Go figure. I had started seeing those going back to 2011, and here we are at 2014 on the cusp of 2015, and it's still happening. They can go in well armed. You think about a national park, you can't go in armed, right? I'd be right. in Yosemite. I'd, I'd carry a gun anyway, but it has me here. But you think about all this stuff that's happening in Yosemite. You know, I've had instances before I even really knew what this was. I had been camping with my grandparents in Happy Camp in 1967 when I was a kid. And remember the trailer getting knocked on and my grandparents leaving the next day and taking us over to Shasta. And I remember being up on top of Sonora Pass in California uh, when I first got out of the service, going up with some friends, shooting some guns, and running into some Marines up there that were on uh, a training, uh, kind of an opposed thing. There was an opposing force somewhere out there, and they heard us shooting, and they came down to us and asking us for ammo because they had seen this monster. And I actually gave them four boxes of two twenty three that I had with me. They had no ammo on them. Good and they ran into this thing on the top of Sonora Pass. So, you know, and had I had a brain, I probably would have figured it out a long time ago, you know, when I first moved into my house, that it could have been something like that. But there's so much skepticism, and I, I admit it. Um, I remember the Air Force when I was still in the military would launch um, phantoms and stuff out looking for UFOs when people would call them in or they'd get a report. And, you know, I just keep thinking about that stuff. Ah, it can't happen. It can't happen. And lo and behold, you know, and it happened to me. And I can't believe with all of the stuff that I hear, not only hear, I read, I scour stuff online. Uh, you know, Will, I sent you that thing about Wyoming. Unknown right, hair, right. Unknown it's a lot more. It's a lot more information that's, than is out in the public. Yes. And and what do you do? What do you do with that? The Indians know that it's BS. Sure they know. Right. The woman seen the afternoon 30 miles away in another town. She's found the next morning with only one shoe, one sock, strange injuries, unknown hair, dying because of loss of blood. Oh, there's some dogs around, so FBI says dog pack killed her. But it's unknown hair and an unknown predator that killed her. Um, yeah, and dog, so, dog attacks are, un are very unlikely, I think. Well, and dog attacks are brutal. Exactly. Brutal. And she had long, shallow scratch marks two to three inches apart, like from four fingers going down her body. There were footprints all around. Well, I sent you all that. You know, there's right. footprints all right. around the body. They were bare, large footprints and that was very quickly covered up. And the local news station, I remember watching a clip, which is now offline, why was the FBI and the DIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, said that, well, you know, the FBI always takes care of cases on um, Indian reservations, but uh, they had shut the Indians out. So the Indians had started doing a separate uh, investigation on their own. Usually the tribal police take care of those things. Yep. But um, like a sheriff can't go in there or anything like that. It can only be the FBI. But they took care of it, cleaned it right up, and very quickly changed the story. Nobody knows Swept what happened. Under the rug. Yep. Unknown hair um, was supposed to be looked at, and they, you know, can't say how they woman got from one place to the other, what happened to her clothes, 
You know, it's just an, another odd thing. And, and I had actually caught part of that on that missing 411 thing. And I, I started thinking about this. This stuff is going on everywhere. You know, this is a very, very good forum for people to discuss this stuff. Because had I not heard Wes, you and your brother uh, story, Will, had I not heard yours, and your friend or the lady that you had on that came from the same town as you when she talked about it out the window and stuff. Right. This is years and years and years. This stuff's been going on. The government obviously knows about it. They're covering it up. But I have a different point of view about it than you based on some of the messages that I had seen. And this is specifically towards you, Will. I, and you guys have talked about you're afraid that, you know, it would ruin the timber industry and all of that. I can tell you by a couple of the messages that I've seen that that's not exactly what they're concerned about. The thing that the verbiage in a couple of these messages is they're afraid that people are going to find out that these things are killing people on a fairly regular basis over a great deal of the United States. And the government has known about it for a long time and has not really done enough to protect people or even notify them that it's a problem. Now, I know that you guys have other contacts that say that, you know, it would crush the economy and all that, but can you think of the outcry if all of a sudden they found out that there had been two, three, or, you know, hundred or oh, sure. thousand? Yep. Right. I, I'm not, I know I'm not saying that the economy is the only reason that it's a comp, um, it would be a combination of things. You know, you're talking economic, there's liability issues, like you were saying. Uh, yeah. if, they, if they know if they know they're killing people and they haven't told everybody, uh, you're talking about civil unrest. And that, from what I have read, is what they're afraid of. And that is why the FBI threatens the way that it does, the Department of Homeland Security, whoever it may be, that's why they have the threats. And the funny thing is they send these special forces guys out, and, and I've heard this a number of times over the last four or five years, um, even from other places. I ran into some guys over where I live that I know were military. I was telling Wes, I, I knew it, being an ex-military man myself, because when they started walking away down the trail, the last guy in line started stutter-stepping so he could be in lockstep. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys were active military. They had very expensive gear. They said that they were there to follow game or something like that, that they didn't have any of their radio gear for tracking deer or bears that, they, that you need. They were heavily armed. They were in big black SUVs. There were six of them. They were talking to others that were somewhere close by. And and I remember thinking, this was all a bunch of BS. These guys are military. And they had asked me why I was there. And I told them, none of your business. <laughs> you know, if you don't have any authority, you don't show me a badge, why should I tell you why I'm there? Because they were, were on were, TV. Were there about a dozen of them? There were six at where I was at, and they were talking to more in another location that was somewhere close by. Because our, our uh, contacts who were special forces say that when they were sent out to kill these things, they learned that they had to do it in no less than 12-man groups. Well, I know there were six where I was at, and there were an equal number of size because they were talking to about people's names and and stuff. And they all had the military haircut. Yeah, you know. it sounds like a kill team. And and they were um, in, a, in a valley south of the Hoopa Reservation. Right. Uh, about 80 That's not, milita not military area at all. No, absolutely not. I, I thought, you know, those guys, they're doing this stuff, and, that, and I'm glad. To be perfectly honest, I'm glad. I'm glad that they're doing something, but um, let me ask you guys this. How many people do you guys know that are actively having problems or hearing from people that are having problems in their area right now? Quite a few, actually. How many can get law enforcement assistance? Some of them are cops, and they get a lot of flack, too. That's true. We do have a lot of cops. Mm -hmm. we, we, we can name several, and, and we know 
the Department of Homeland Security has been there because they photographed their vehicles and ran the plates, and that's what it came back as. Now, think about that. You're in law enforcement. And they're told to leave it alone. Why? Public outcry? Or it's going to damage somebody's reputation? When you think about bureaucrats, think about how they must act and feel about people if they could allow this to go on knowing that people are being killed. They don't think very highly of the public. That's one of the reasons why I'm going to start trying to, I'm, I'm working on something right now to start pushing this forward and why I reached out to you guys. And then the funny thing, and when I was talking to Wes earlier, I told him that if I would have been in his situation, um, surrounded the way he and his brother, uh, I don't know if you're there, Woody, but hey, Woody, I might have pulled, pulled the trigger. And, but then I, I said, you know, the funny thing is I didn't. <laughs> That's a tricky situation where you got a group like that, though. I know. I know. Um, I I think about how scared I was, and I can't um, even imagine how scared Wes and Woody were. And I had told Wes earlier, the only thing that frightened me more than that was indirect fire. You know, and you're right, it is a terrifying situation. And you would think, shoot, but, I mean, you know, you were – standing there right in front of one, you could have blown its head off, and he didn't. He probably couldn't have gotten you either after you blew its head off. But you just go through this weird fear of, I mean, you know, I don't have to explain it to you. Um, well, yeah, you know, you know what it is. I, I don't know how I know it, but he was letting me know that he could have had me, and I know damn well he knew that I could have had him. You know, mutually assured mm -hmm. destruction. Even after that, I was so careful, further distance back, and this is what, and, and Shannon, sweetheart, let me tell you something. If you do want to do this, do it from a distance, because when you get close, it will be a lot worse than you can ever possibly think. Am yeah. I right, Wes? Yeah, it's, uh, it's life-changing, and it is worse than, wor worse than you can imagine. It is worse than you can imagine when you get up too close. From a distance, is not from a distance. I think wouldn't be too bad. It, even then, it's still life changing. But up close, mm -hmm. uh, it'll give you nightmares. Yeah, all the time I saw it at a distance, I, I I felt like I was in control. But when I was close, I had none. Absolutely yeah. none. Yeah, and you feel very small too. You feel very very small compared to the yeah. Minor, you know, yeah. I don't know time. how you know how tall you are. I'm I'm, I'm a tall, big, broad-shouldered guy, and um, I felt like I just couldn't believe that I was looking man, I know if this is not words for it. I feel like a grasshopper. <laughs> I feel yeah, like a yeah, grasshopper. I'm sure the word so. humble doesn't even cover it. No, it doesn't. Yeah. You know, it's interesting about the uh, Bob Garrett case, and you know, we don't have to go into too many details on it if you don't want to, but um, a lot of people don't know the full story about the torn up camp. And I know Bob has gotten, and a lot of people who don't know the story, basically what happened is Bob showed up to this place where he goes out and does research and he does different things. He went out there late at night, came across this camp, and the camp looked like King Kong went through and destroyed it. And a lot of people don't know that people were actually killed during that. Bob doesn't say that. I, I don't think he can say that. But a lot of the details that you talked about, Ken, uh, even off the air, really makes you it, – it, it really enrages me that this goes on. Who's ever orchestrating the whole thing back and forth with these emails, they don't care. They just don't want this to come out. And if people die, they die. Um, they, they'll say it's a bear. They'll say it's a serial killer. I mean, they tried to put Bob in prison for filming it. Bob, I, and, then they, I, and then they realized they couldn't. You know what I mean? It was yeah. like, really? You're going to put them in prison over it? Yeah. And, and like I told you earlier, somebody in Texas had, a, had been watching his back because they had two very specific case points of law. 
that he could not be in prison. Now, yeah, it was his his attorney is who who I think. Yeah, was well, who it very well could have been. I you know I, I didn't take time to write down names and anything like that. But I tell you something. When I looked at this big ticket thing and when I read this biosphere, and I'm not sure what the hell all of that was about, but it had something to do with some laws that were passed a long time ago. Had it been in another park, it would have been a different situation, especially the big ticket preserve. Most people don't realize someone survived that night. And most people don't know that part of the story. There was a yeah. guy who, who survived that night, and uh, this is another part of the story most people don't realize. The guy, So the two people that died, one guy had his head popped off. The other one was slammed against a tree and thrown up in a tree. The guy that survived ended up in the hospital in shock over the whole thing. And all of a sudden, he got really, really quiet. He didn't want to talk to anyone about it. He didn't want to talk. I mean, all it's almost like someone kind of got to this guy and told him to shut his mouth about it. And the other part of the story most people don't realize, because I know they see the video online, and they think Bob made this whole thing up. And if you know Bob personally, even without knowing all the side notes about the emails and knowing the backstory, Bob, as far as a man's word goes, is good as it gets. Bob doesn't make things up. There's a lot of things that people don't know about Bob that Bob could brag about, and he doesn't. But this story in particular, they were going to nail the survivor with murder. That's another thing most people don't know about the story. They were going to nail the guy with murder, saying he murdered these two guys. And the problem that they ran into was, how do you explain the guy being in shock in the hospital? And while he was in shock in the hospital, all he would mutter was monsters, monsters, monsters. And they couldn't figure out what the hell was wrong with this guy. So there's a bigger picture to the story that most people don't realize, and Bob doesn't talk about. And I don't even know if Bob can talk about. Some funny things I read that uh, some of the people were poking fun at a certain agency over their very, very slow response time and waiting till it was basically broad daylight before they got there. That was the first thing. And, and second, that they didn't seem too concerned about starting a search for missing people, trying to find any information on anyone that died at that point in time in and around that area is it's not there. So I don't know how they covered it up. I know that they were trying to use a, quote, serial story, you know, but it's not going to hold much water. In fact, one of the, the messages said that these, these guys aren't stupid, meaning guys like Bob and that, that go out and do this all the time, that know what this is, that know what's taking place. They're not dumb. And, and I think there was, the last message that one of them said is, you know, at some point someone's going to start taking things into their own hands. And this is, in a, this is in a park that's in between two very large areas in, in Texas, meaning Houston and Dallas, that has thousands of visitors every year, and they're taking their kids and their family and their friends into a place where you could be eaten. Go live with that. Yeah. Right. Back up the valley, get a tent, head on down there, and... Yeah, by the way, you might want to bring a dozen or so guys with guns with you if they're not going to do anything about it. Well, that's the other thing, too, about the story. You had mentioned waiting until daylight. Bob had called. Most people don't know this part of the story either, um, and Bob doesn't talk about it. Bob called 911 before he actually started filming anything. He called 911, and they brushed him off on it. So he went around trying to see if anyone needed help first and then decided to document it because the more he walked around, the more he realized something's wrong here. This isn't like a drunken fight. This isn't um, something's not right here. And he noticed all the footprints, and he noticed um, he started even filmed some of the footprints around there. And how about, how about the drag marks? The drag marks, yeah. The bodies being dragged off, he noticed that too. I think he even filmed yeah. that. Yeah, he did. It was quite clear. Yeah. And it took 16 hours before anyone showed up. And I know you and I talked about this, but no one yeah. showed up to help or look for missing people. The people that showed up dumped sand and then drove tracks, drove a truck through there back and forth covering up prints. 
that was the help that actually showed up. So, I mean, it, yeah. it's it's disturbing. It's very disturbing. Yeah. Everything that I read was old information, you know, going back to 2013 and and so on. So I didn't I didn't even know that they were found. I know that they were explicitly told not to put them on any missing person list and not to put together a search party. That is horrifying. And even with that piece of information right there, that's enough to make anyone irate to hear that. If that was your son or daughter or your wife or your family member, and no one really cares, they just immediately move to cover it up, something's wrong there. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's something yeah, exactly. going on here. And, and that's the other reason why I had pointed out the 411 stuff. And like I said, you know, agree, disagree, Dave Politis had done a really good job with pointing out a lot of specific he investigated. He didn't come up with a conclusion, right, mm -hmm. who's doing it or how it happened, but he's pointed out things that are common in all of these areas. Now, whether or not it's all Bigfoot or, or some crackpot or an alien zapping people off the, you know, Yabba Dabba land, the point is that they had people have seen these things. That one case that he talks about, that uh, the Martin case, that he knows better than anyone. The people saw a big hairy thing carrying a kid. In come a mm -hmm. hundred green berets, and they do their own searching and leave. But yet the yeah. father's never told that his child is most likely dead. Right? He's just left missing. There's no documentation on it, or not good documentation. And it's happening in parks where you live. It's happening in the parks where I live. And that's why something's got to be done. And I think you've got an outstanding forum here. I, I think you've got good people. Will, obviously, is probably one of these most knowledgeable people, and which is why I decided to contact you. I tried contacting the other folks, but I got a squatch guy talking about squatches yeah. all the time. And, and and no information. I've learned more in a month and a month and a half from you guys, besides what I already knew, on a direction. You know, what should be done? That's What was the, the first question I asked you? Do you think some one should be shot? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and now what happens after that has got to be dealt with very, very carefully. It, it is you just can't just run it up the flagpole because you're liable to find yourself in <laughs> uh, missing. Yeah, yeah, having a car accident, right? Uh -huh. um, but no, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about this and and the fact that that you have information that I'm seeing and hearing the same things and. Will is seeing and hearing the same things. I'm sure, Shannon, you've got your resources and people that you talk to. And, yes, I think it was good that you uh, – there was too many weenies and glad to get some buns on the show, so I have to agree with that. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, Ken, before uh, you yeah, go uh, – Yes. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 didn't, um, I didn't jump in early enough at, to tell you – early you don't have to ever apologize or anything you say <laughs> well I'm on the air with you that's never a problem um, well as far as far as what's that I said that's fine thank you yeah oh, Shannon's yeah. like one of the guys yeah okay. and yeah <laughs> well, no, I'm you're talking about to that. an alpha male type so you might want to limit that one of the guys thing because I'll mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to the emails about the big thicket in that area um, did you because the whole serial killer excuse really, you know, it fascinates me. It, it, did you do any cursory searches on that? And can you actually Google, yes. you know, serial killer Texas? Did anything ever pop up? I mean, did that ever um, get, was that a use have, of blame? Right, right in between the Sam Houston National Forest and the Big Ticket mm -hmm. Preserves, the four locations of Big Ticket, and you got to be careful about the big thicket because the Texans kind of call all the East Woods big thicket, and I had a hard problem with that trying to understand what they were talking about. In between the two is an area where they call the Texas 40 
and there's 40 missing people in between those two areas. A lot of them from okay. in town. There's if you understand the amount of people missing that go missing in Texas, Shannon, you would have a heart attack. I'm not kidding you. Even Dave Politis talks about this, um, that there are so many missing in Texas, it could have a book of its own. And a lot of them are from <clears throat> that eastern area in Texas. In fact, they were looking for a young couple in Oklahoma around the same time that this was happening to Bob last year, um, finding a torn-up camp that were headed to Texas that were never seen again. They made it to the missing persons list. There was some comments and references about this couple, but they're believed to be dead now, um, as well as, you know, the serial story of the Texas 40, and they're adding names to that list. They just had another name a few months ago that disappeared right at the tip of one of the uh, areas of the big ticket, the one to the farthest west. The guy was literally right at the edge of the park on a road, and uh, he he disappeared. They just added his name to the list. Um, but they just – the other thing that I, I had told Wes before we had got on the call is that the official cover story was going to be that a car drove through the camp. And I did, I did do a search back earlier today, and there are comments on a couple of the websites – that, oh, yeah, it looks like a car drove through the camp. So go figure that. You guys can verify that yourself. Yeah. Jeez. And, yeah, and, and I'm dead serious. Getting getting the burner phones, go buying some inexpensive video equipment. Um, these are all things that I had to do because I wasn't getting help. I know that my sheriff's department wouldn't do, wouldn't lift a finger. And, mm -hmm. and to be perfectly honest, if I did start a shooting, they probably wouldn't have arrested me either. Um, but it it was just the the number of people that were around, hearing about the pot growers just occurring where I live, hearing about the things that I was hearing from all over this area, not just, you know, my my zip code, but things that, that were taking place 50, 60, 70 miles away, the activity, and if you notice, and I've heard some of your reports, Shannon, talking about stuff in Pennsylvania, Ohio. It's happening everywhere. There's more and more interactions because there's more people who are pushing closer to the forest. Now, the funny thing is, and, and I've noticed this myself, the people in Eureka, California, don't see this as being a bad thing. They don't have a lot of disappearances, but yet they don't have a lot of incursions into that forest. There's a few campgrounds. Been to Happy Camp myself, you know, been to Willow Creek. Not a lot of vicious activity, but you get down around areas where there's logging, a lot of hunting. You know, you go to the other side of the mountains from Eureka, California, over towards Shasta, Lassen, it's different. You start getting up around the California-Oregon border, it's different. You have the campground incident up at Rogue River. Um, what was the name of that campground that had the problem a few years ago? And then you go up the Cascades. You have all the stuff at Crater Lake. I know about stuff at Sisters. In fact, I was talking to my father today, and today is the very first day that I told my father that something like this had happened to me because of the potential ridicule. I'm a professional person in a job that requires character and upstanding. And if I were to go to the stuff of my work, I'm pretty sure that I would be out of the office door so fast my head would spin. And I told my dad, and I had him, I played some stuff for him today, and he thought, oh, my God. He goes, this stuff's happening? He goes, that thing that they were talking about, the airplane uh, in, in – uh, Mount Hood, he goes, that was back quite a few years ago when we lived in Astoria. He goes, I remember that. When did that airplane crash with the people disappearing happen? Oh, it was a while back. I know what you're talking I know exactly what you're talking about. Like during during the nineties? Yeah, I would say nineties. Yeah. Well Min Will had mentioned it on a show that I played for my father earlier and, and my dad said if he remembers that. They never did find the bodies. They couldn't understand. My my parents live in Oregon. Yeah, and, it's like um, everyone on board vanished. Yeah, 
yeah. And my father and I, a uh, long time ago, down in Elk Hill, um, in the Deschutes National Forest, neck broke, guts taken out. Oh, and the other thing I found out and I wanted to tell you about was the gut thing. The, the gentleman that was trying to, quote, capture the bear for me from Fish and Game, I asked him about why an animal would eat the guts and not eat the, the meat. You know, when you look at an elk, when people poach an elk, what do they go for? The back strap, right? Or some of the better areas of the elk. Um, the one that my dad found and the, the deer that I found around where I live had the guts taken or certain parts of it. I didn't go digging around fishing to find out which ones were still left. Um, I wasn't that curious. He had told me why bears and stuff do that, you know, eating the skin of the salmon and calorie per bite, how much nutrition that they get and the liver of a deer and, and certain parts of a deer have bite per bite four or five, six times as many calories as eating this flesh off the, the deer. And he said hmm. any deer, like the number of calories for the, the certain insides or like four or five times as much as what's the flesh that's on the bone. Now, I never looked it up to see if it was true, but I know I've seen bears rip the skin off uh, salmon and drop the rest of the salmon just because it's nothing but fat. And I, I thought that was odd. And when he told me that, and he said, you need to be careful around kills like that because generally the predator is still in the area. And the funny thing is the whole time we had been talking about bears and when he talked about that when I had changed a conversation he had said predator he had never used that word before but he wasn't a dumb guy I mean he had the, the bottom part of a 55 gallon drum it was about six or eight inches thick it was enough dog food in there to feed a full-grown bear for three days because he wasn't planning on coming back for three days that was lifted out of the trap without the trap being set off and carried off, and we didn't find it. Well, we found a little bit outside the, the tube, the back of the tube. There was a few pieces that came out that were probably in the back of the trap. But, you know, you think about that. Think about that capability and that it's roaming around yakult. It's disturbing. Yeah. It makes you wonder. You from oh, I'm only uh, 20, 25 minutes away. You still go up there? Yeah, I go up there occasionally. Usually only during the day, but yeah, I, I go up there occasionally. Looking? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm very well armed when I go up. Well, I know you guys got some very good audio because I've heard some of this exact stuff that I've heard out in the woods around my house. I, I don't know what they're saying. I can't repeat it. I don't know the growl. I know that thing that shook my window that night that got scared to death out of me. I know that was infrasound. And I think what I told you was is, is the Marine, I, I wasn't trained for combat. I was trained in aviation, and I was, I was working as a temporary a TFO, and I was being a loadmaster on a C-130 delivering gear to Marines in the southern Philippines after they lifted martial law in 1980. So I got stuck with them. It was either that or to go to the mess hall for six to nine months, and I didn't want to do that. So I helped these guys, and I got the stay and work with the Marines for about six, almost nine months uh, off and on. And, of course, the rest of the time I spent in a long apo in the, in the PI, so that was nothing but fun. But, you know, the, the, the guys were teaching me about um, mortars because some of the people that we were looking for had old U.S. military gear. And, you know, he said, whenever you have low-frequency stuff that shakes and vibrates your body and your brain and your head, he goes, that's what damages you. That's what kills you. I know when we we had called in a strike one time, and they used thousand pound bombs. We had to back up because of the concussion. The number of bombs that they were dropping in close proximity would have killed us if we would have just stayed where we were at. <clears throat> just because of the concussion alone, we have not been hit by any fragments. We would have been dead. Our guts would have almost liquefied. He was going through this whole process with me. I told him. I said, you know wow, so what do I do? You know, he's teaching me all of this stuff. And he's talking about covering your ears, open your mouth, you know, try to turn away from it, bend over, try to make your body as small as possible and all of this. 
And that same stuff that I had heard and seen there, that vibration, my dual pane megabucks windows were shaking. Um, I have a blue handmade cross that is a stained glass, and I'm a religious guy, and, and I, it was hanging inside the window, and it was vibrating, and the the, the curtains, I mean, the, the whole thing. And, and I know the infrasound comes up, but the noise that it made was so odd, and it had a rhythm to it. I don't know, like I said, when the, when the, whoever it was slammed the tailgate or the truck door, it stopped. The concentration stopped, and the deer was able to get away. If you go out and into the woods and you hear something that makes you feel strange, flee. Was it a growl? It wasn't a growl then, is what you heard? It was kind of a low, rumbling growl, but it was deep, and it wasn't loud. Yes. Okay. It wasn't as loud as I would have, it wasn't as loud as the screams that he would do when he would go over the ridge, but it was very kind of, it was, that Kumbo said it in the second Kumbo show that you guys have on your thing, he spelled it out to a T that was absolutely perfect explanation of it and I just remember I was sitting here I was these windows and, and all of this stuff and laying in bed and I was in a half psychotic mood anyway having a bunch of steroids pumped into me and I was looking at this deer doing the the, the funkadelic and it, it couldn't move it was just standing there and its head was kind of you know almost like an old 80s rock video type thing its feet and um, but once that concentration was broke, instantly that deer realized threat gone. All the other deer were already gone. I don't know how it didn't affect them because there were some still close by. It was more like he was he was facing directly at my window at this deer, which was in between the two of us. No, I think it was really good to talk to you guys, especially you Wes earlier today and and Shannon. And like I said, I'm going to continue to work on what I'm working on. Um, I'm going to contact you when I get a more well-developed plan. On how yeah, contact to contact me with that because I might be able to help you with that. Are you interested in being part of it? Yeah, absolutely. I contacted you guys for a reason. This is the reason. Uh, I couldn't find anyone else that it, that had the knowledge, the background, and the experience. It's it's got to be a group, and what we had talked about with the properties and stuff like that. The only way that this can be pulled off. Is, is it disappears in a threatening fashion. You understand? Yeah, absolutely. You can't, and, you can't go out and do it. You have to make it appear that they came to us. And I know that enough from reading what I read that, that that's a big kicker there. So when I get more to this and, and I get a more definitive plan, I'll reach out to you guys. If I hear anything else, or if you guys want to know anything else uh, about either me or any of my stuff, feel free to reach out at any time. The communications are now open, and uh, I appreciate every, everything that you guys have done today. Man, oh, man, what an incredible story, eh? I know it's a lot to digest at one time. For some of you, it's way too much to believe. Take a little time. Think about it. If nothing else, what I'd like for you to take with you is be safe, be aware, and be prepared next time you go out into the wilderness. There's a lot more to this world than what meets the eye.
a squatch. <laughs> 